So how do messenger RNA molecules, now that we've seen all of transcription and mRNA processing, how do those messenger RNA get translated? Changing one language, the language of messenger RNA, into the language of amino acids. So the first question is, Basically, how do we turn four letters, an alphabet that uses A's, G's, C's, and U's, into the alphabet that uses 20 letters? A, C, D, E, F, G, the single letter codes for the amino acids. You do not have to memorize these, obviously. You'll always be able to look them up if you want. We're going from four nucleotides to 20 amino acids. How does this work? So here you go. There's a eukaryotic messenger RNA sequence. What's the first step of translation? How do we read this? How do we turn this into a protein? How does the cell know where to start? We start with the, please, yes, we start with the start codon. So we have to find a start codon. How do we find the start codon? So where do we start translation, the start codon? Where do we end translation? Please. Stop codon. Yep. But how do we know where the code stop codon is and where the start codon is. Does anybody remember what the, go ahead. Okay, so the way this is written, where is the five prime end of this RNA molecule? The C, right, so this is a five prime end the messenger RNA. Here's the three prime end, where the three prime poly A tail is. Look, there it is. Poly A tail. Which means that somewhere upstream to the left, five prime of the poly A tail, what sequence should we see? About 15 to 25 nucleotides up from where the actual poly A is. This is one of the sequences that you should remember. Which one? <laughs> Talking about what's, this, what's the DNA sequence that causes the poly A tail to be added about 15 to 20 nucleotides down from it? What's the poly A signal sequence? AAUAAA. So that will be in every messenger RNA that you look at somewhere, about 15 to 20 nucleotides up to the left, five prime of the poly A tail. You should see that poly A signal sequence. Okay. So that helps. We're starting to recognize what's present in messenger RNA molecules and what's part of a gene that's not in the messenger RNA molecule. So what is this start codon? Does anybody know the three? AUG. It's AUG. OK, so which? I see multiple AUGs in here. There's one there. I think I saw another one. There's one there. How do we know which AUG is the start codon to produce the protein that this messenger RNA encodes? Pardon? It's the first one. What does that make all of this? Is it, what did you say? Is it promoter? Is this promoter?
It's, an, it's a fine distinction. The promoter is not transcribed, so the promoter never becomes part of a messenger RNA molecule. So something that is transcribed that is not translated, is it an intron? Is this an intron? What is the molecule in red? I didn't say this, so I'll give you a break. This is messenger RNA. This is a processed transcript, messenger RNA. Will it have any introns in it? If it's mature messenger RNA, when does splicing happen? Before or after it's a messenger RNA? Before. Processing, capping, tailing, then it's a mature messenger RNA. So all of the introns that are going to be, have been spliced out have been by this point. So this thing here is not promoter, it's not intron. If translation starts here at the first start codon, what's true about the 10 or so nucleotides there to the five prime of the start codon? Are they translated or are they not? Translation starts here. Is everything to the left of the AUG translated or not? Yes or no? No. OK, so that stuff's untranslated. Hopefully, this is going to start ringing some bells soon. This is the. Do you have it? I heard an O. Oh. Do you know what this is? It's an untranslated region, UTR. There are two of them in every messenger RNA. So this is untranslated because it's to the left of the start codon. <coughs> so it's not going to be, this is a messenger RNA sequence that doesn't get turned into protein. It's untranslated. Which UT, there are two UTRs in most messenger RNAs. Which one is this? It's the five prime UTR, so the five prime into the transcript. Okay. Where's the other UTR? Take a wild guess. Three prime, right? So the other end of the transcript is going to have the three prime UTR. And today we're going to figure out where it is as well. So we're starting to get a sense of how the cell reads the primary, tra or the mature transcript. In a eukaryote, which this is because it says so at the top, the first AUG is where translation starts. Everything before that is untranslated region. Translation proceeds from AUG to the right, towards the three prime end, until the first stop codon is reached. Then translation stops. Everything past that is then the three prime untranslated region. The poly A tail definitely is part of the three prime UTR, but not all of it. First, so what, we, what do we need to do to figure out where the three prime UTR is? This is important for that PDF worksheet as well that you have from a few classes ago. We need to know, exactly, we need to know where the stop codon is. That's the one thing we haven't figured out yet for this transcript. We've got the start code on the first AUG reading from five prime to three prime in eukaryotes. We just need to figure out where's the stop code on. So that's something we're going to work on today. So again, objectives for the next three classes, now that we're talking about translation, is to understand the structure of proteins and amino acids and the structure and the function of ribosomes, the enzymes that actually produce proteins, and then to compare and contrast prokaryotic and eukaryotic translation. The goal for you, what I hope you'll be able to do by the end of the next three classes, is to take a messenger RNA molecule like the one we were just looking at, use a codon table, and translate the messenger RNA into a protein, which means you're going to have to know where is the start codon, 
figure out which codon is the stop codon, and then actually use the codon tail to do, table to do the translating. We're also going to work a lot on predicting how mutations that affect a gene change the protein, hence the Socrative quiz this morning, which provided you with an ideal situation where there's a mutation. I've asked you to predict how does that affect the protein. So that's where we're headed. The ribosome is one of those chicken and the egg paradoxes. A ribosome is a protein that produces proteins. So where did the ribosome come from? I don't know. But all the ribosome is is a collection of amino acids, proteins, and RNA molecules that's responsible for reading an RNA molecule and producing the protein that that RNA molecule encodes. So here's the first step of comparing and contrasting prokaryotic and eukaryotic translation. Bacteria and humans and other eukaryotes, all have ribosomes that are made out of two main parts, a small subunit, the little bubble up there, small subunit, and a big subunit. They're numbered differently. You don't have to remember the numbers in prokaryotic, prokaryotes and eukaryotes. The simple point is they look structurally similar. They do similar things. So there's actually not that much contrasting of prokaryotic to eukaryotic translation to do yet. So far, it's all pretty similar. Also note that not only are the ribosomes, the things that read the messenger RNA molecule, made out of proteins, but they also incorporate some RNA molecules themselves. So these are not RNA molecules that the ribosome translates into protein. These are actually part of the structure of the ribosome. These are RNAs that help the ribosome read messenger RNAs. Those are ribosomal RNAs, RNAs that are incorporated into ribosomes. The last category, which I mentioned a few classes ago, we've got messenger RNAs, we've got ribosomal RNAs now, and the third class that should concern you for this class, third class of RNAs that should concern you for this class, are transfer RNAs. So these should all be familiar from the reading. But briefly, here's what a transfer RNA looks like. It forms because RNAs are single-stranded and they can base pair with themselves. Transfer RNAs form this cloverleaf structure. Why are transfer RNAs so important? What does the transfer RNA actually do for translation? Why are they critical? Yeah, they bring, these are the molecules that actually contain the amino acid that gets, the next single amino acid that gets incorporated into a growing amino acid chain, a protein. So there's at least one transfer every RNA for every of, of the 20 amino acids. And this is important because this is the molecule that actually does the translating. This is where RNA code gets turned into protein code. Because here, at the bottom of the transfer RNA molecule is the anti-codon loop. That, look what it's base paired with, the messenger RNA. So this is where, where there's base pair complementation between the transfer RNA and the messenger RNA that the ribosome is reading. That's where the messenger RNA code, GCA, gets translated into amino acid code. Whatever amino acid is connected to that transfer RNA is what gets incorporated into the protein at that spot. Bless you. Yeah. So this is where translation actually happens. It's the transfer RNA, the one molecule where an RNA is actually physically connected to an amino acid. So base pairing there in the anti-codon loop means that RNA molecule, when it's base paired with the messenger RNA, the tRNA and mRNA base paired together, that's where translation happens. Okay. So here we get to start talking about differences between eukaryotic and prokaryotic translation. It's exactly the same set of steps as we saw in transcription. How does it start? How does it proceed? How does it stop? Initiation, elongation, and termination. So here's a big difference 
that's important to know between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. In prokaryotes, this is all happening inside the ribosome, by the way. So I could draw a couple of blobs on here that represent the ribosome subunits. One of those ribosomal RNA genes has a particular sequence, and it's base pair complementary to a sequence that's pre This is one you don't have to remember. A DNA sequence or an RNA sequence that's present in every transcript. All right, so here we're talking about, here's a messenger RNA molecule that's being translated by a bacterium. In it is the Schein-Dalgarno sequence, and it's complementary to this part of the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. What this does is it positions the ribosome, right, to start translating at the start codon. So in prokaryotes, it's not necessarily the first AUG. It's still AUG that's the start codon. It's not necessarily the first one reading from 5 prime to 3 prime down the messenger RNA molecule. It's the first one past the Schein-Dalgarno sequence. So you could imagine the 5 prime into the messenger RNA molecule could be up here. And there could be some RNA sequence here. But translation would not start at this AUG because it's not to the right of the Schein-Dalgarno sequence. The ribosome becomes assembled at the Schein-Dalgarno sequence, and then it starts moving as you would probably expect from 5 prime to 3 prime, from left to right here, and it starts translating when it, the ribosome, encounters the first AUG, reading from left to right, starting at the Schein-Dalgarno Schein sequence. Any questions about this so far? So that's prokaryotes. Not the first AUG, just the first one to the right of this particular DNA sequence where the ribosome assembles onto the messenger RNA. How does this differ from eukaryotes? What do you know about how eukaryotic translation starts? Where does the, how does the ribosome first associate with messenger RNA in eukaryotes? Do eukaryotes have a Schein-Dalgarno sequence? No. We're eukaryotes. We do things more fancily. Fancy? Forgive me for making up words. How does the ribosome first interact with the messenger RNA mo molecule in eukaryotes? This is another one of those places where that 5 prime 7 methyl guanosine cap is important. Remember, that's a molecule that tells cellular machinery that this is a fully processed messenger RNA molecule that's ready to be translated. And in eukaryotes, the small subunit actually physically binds to that 7 methyl guanine cap. So the ribosome in prokaryotes assembles on the Schein Dalgarno sequence, which is somewhere in the messenger RNA molecule. In eukaryotes, the ribosome assembles at the very 5' prime end of the messenger RNA molecule, at the 5' prime end, on the cap. And then the ribosome moves 5' prime to 3' prime along the messenger RNA molecule, left to right, until it encounters, as in prokaryotes, the first AUG. And that's where the full ribosome is assembled and translation starts. So that's how we find the start codon. Prokaryotes, it's the first one to the right of the Schein-Dalgarno sequence. In eukaryotes, it's the first AUG that you would encounter if you just read the messenger RNA left to right.
And that's initiation. That's how the ribosome gets going. Like in transcription, I'm going to go through elongation much more quickly. The ribosome is where transfer RNA molecules bind. That's where that base pairing between the anticodon loop and the messenger RNA molecule does the translating. That's how the messenger RNA sequence gets turned into an amino acid sequence, because the amino acid that's connected to that transfer RNA gets connected to a growing chain of amino acids, the protein. This happens essentially the same in prokaryotes and eukaryotes, much like the process of transcription elongation is very similar in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Okay, so here's the really important point. How do we find the stop codon? What happens at a stop codon? There is no transfer RNA. How many stop codons are there, by the way? Three. So with AUG, I guarantee you, prokaryote or eukaryote is the start codon. Always. There are three stop codons. Stop codons, there is no transfer RNA for because that would be weird for a transfer RNA because it wouldn't be connected to an amino acid because there is no amino acid for a codon that doesn't encode amino acid. So no, there are no transfer RNAs for these three codons. And the way termination works is when a ribosome is waiting there on a messenger RNA molecule for a transfer RNA molecule that never comes because there isn't one for that codon, Eventually, a different protein, a release factor, RF, goes and binds where a transfer RNA molecule normally would inside the ribosome, and that unlocks, essentially, the ribosome. It falls off the RNA, and translation ends. So in a nutshell, those are the steps. So those are the three stop codons, UAG, UAA, and UGA. You can remember them if you want to. It might make things a little bit faster for you working on exercises and exams. The, other, the only other point that's really important to make here is stop codons are also vocabulary, sometimes called nonsense codons. So I may use one or the other of those terms, stop or nonsense codon. They mean the same thing. Questions, concerns, comments? Okay. So that's how the process. Now we get to actually do some translation. Hopefully, you've all seen the code on table before, at least in the reading, if not in other classes. Does somebody want to? Tell us quickly how to use a codon table? I'd rather not. I want to make you do the work. What are these letters circled in blue on the left side of the codon table? So it's the first, it's the first nucleic acid in the codon. So the U's, the C's, the A's, and the G's are grouped together. And then what's on that axis in red? That's the second letter. OK. And then the third letters are over here on the right side. Okay. So if I tell you a codon is AUA, what amino acid is that? Let's see. There's AUA. 
So then it's up to you to decide whether or not you want to remember the three-letter codes, the one-letter codes, or just the full names of the amino acids. You will be asked to do things with the single-letter codes and the three-letter codes. So in this case, ILE is isoleucine. Its single-letter code is the one that's in parentheses, I. What's weird about the codon table? How many amino acids are there? There are 20 amino acids, and there are 64 codons, right? Four options at each of three spots, so four times four times four, 64 different codons in this table. Is that weird? We've got 20 amino acids, we've got 64 codons, so 64 RNA triplets stand for 20 letters in the amino acid code. So what does that necessarily mean about the codon table? It's degenerate, which means that there are multiple codons that stand for single amino acids. Which ones are the most overrepresented? Which, which amino acids have the most codons? Which one? Leucine. Has a whole whopping six codons, all of which stand for one amino acid. What's the other one? Arginine. Arginine, which is how you remember its single letter code is R. R. It's not talk like a, like a pirate day, though, unfortunately. So we've got arginine. Is there another one? Serine. Let's see. Yep. So we've got serine, which has four there. Note, that, note the pattern. What's typical about codons that encode the same amino acid, regardless if, it, regardless if it's six or four or three? What's the typical pattern here? First two letters. Yeah, the first two letters tend to be the same. So the first position, the second position tend to be the same. The third position often differs. So serine is up here and also down there. There may be one or two others. So there are a lot of codons that have, there are a few codons that have six, a few amino acids that have six codons, some that have four, some that have three. Who are the poor, poor lonely single codon amino acids? Who's only got one? Methionine. Methionine. Which means that if AUG is the start codon, what does every protein start with? Which amino acid? Methionine. OK, there are a few others. Tryptophan, for example, has a single codon. So there's a variety. Some amino acids, you can have a lot of different codons. Some have very few, which has real implications in how mutations can affect the proteins that are encoded by genes. The same is true about the fact that most of these, for example, let's focus on alanine here in the bottom. The four codons that start with GC something. What's going to happen if a mutation hits the third position in a codon that's encoding alanine? A single point mutation. One nucleotide changes to a different nucleotide. Does that affect the protein? If you change one of those nucleotides to any other of the four nucleotides, what's the protein that's, or what's the amino acid that's encoded? It's the same. So in this case, we have a mutation that doesn't actually affect a protein. What happens if I have a mutation in the first position of an alanine codon? Let's say we're going to talk about GCU. What happens if we change the first, have a mutation at the first position in that codon? Does that change the amino acid that's encoded? Absolutely. So if you make G A, you encode threonine instead of alanine. If G becomes C, it's proline. If G becomes U, it's serine. So the position of a mutation, if it's the first position in the codon, the second position, or the third position, has a really big effect on whether or not you're likely or not likely to change the amino acid that's encoded by that messenger RNA. Okay. 
let's put this into practice. This is from that PDF exercise I keep talking about that I distributed a few classes ago. It's eukaryotic, it's messenger RNA. So where was, how do we start? What happens in the cell? You've got a mature messenger RNA, what's the first step <coughs> for translation? Find AUG. Find the AUG, so what is the ribosome doing? It's good at, right, so it binds to the five, the seven methylguanine cap, and it starts reading left to right. So where's our first AUG? Right there. Okay, without looking at a codon table, which amino acid is this going to be translated into? Methionine. Okay, now what happens? We have to look at another codon, another three nucleotides, and translate that. Okay, so what are the next three nucleotides we're looking at in this case? Okay, GCC. So important point here, although you're all, most of you are familiar with this, the ribosome moves to the next three nucleotides. It doesn't move one nucleotide at a time and read groups of three. It moves a full three, reads the next three, GCC, then CCC, AUC, and so forth. So that's how translation <coughs> proceeds, that elongation. So in that case, these are the codons, AUG, GCC, CCC. I've set them off with hyphens here. And in red is the first of the stop codons that gets encountered. The most important thing that I want you to know about this figure which is really important, is that where that first AUG is tells the ribosome which reading frame, that is which groups of three, it should be reading and translating into amino acid code. Which means that this is not necessarily the first UAG that you would read if you read from left to right through the messenger RNA molecule. This is the first one that's in sync, not the band type, that's in the reading frame with that AUG. So once you find that start codon, you have to read in those groups of three to find one of those three stop codons. You know, in this example, there is not a stop codon you would encounter before that first UAG anyway, but there are times when you might. So then, as we discussed earlier, everything after that stop codon is three prime untranslated region, including the poly A tail. So now, when you know the start codon and you find the stop codon, everything on either side of them, to the left and to the right, those are the UTRs. And with that knowledge, then you can finish question one on the transcription translation PDF worksheet find the start codon, the stop codon, everything on either side is UTR. Untranslated region. Okay. So hopefully you'll finish this for next class. Use it as exercise if you feel like you need exercise using a codon table. I've translated the first two codons. You translate the rest. Bring the answer back next time. So where does transcription or translation start? What codon? AUG. Start codon. It ends at the stop codon. So how can you predict how long a protein would be? How many amino acids? What dictates the size of a protein? <laughs> Distance between the start and the stop codon. So if you find the start codon, you find the stop codon, you can just count how many codons are there. And that gives you a way to predict how big a protein would be. 
the distance between the start and the stop codons. This takes us into preparing for next class. Next class, we're going to do a bunch of group work. Hopefully, you'll find it useful and interesting. It'll be a little bit different than today where I'm just yakking at you. To start, though, I want to run you through a brief tutorial about accessing some online information that you're going to need to bring to class with you next time so that we stay on task. So what I'm going to ask everybody to do in class, and this is, I'm going to walk you through one example of how to do this. I need everybody to bring a messenger RNA sequence with you to class next time. And I don't want to just give you the same one because that's boring. The point I'm trying to make next class is to look at lots of different messenger RNA molecules together and to translate them. So I don't want you to get together with friends and all choose the same gene. I'd rather everybody choose a totally different gene. So work on a gene that you like. We're all going to use, because I'm in command apparently, worm genes. And I want to show you how to use this website, wormbase.org, to find the specific, the specific type of gene that I'm trying to ask you to bring. So I'm going to walk you through the step. This will be homework for next time. So before next class, come with one messenger RNA sequence. So if you go to when you go to wormbase.org, you don't have to do this now, but you can follow along if you want. You use the tools menu and select gbrowse. It stands for genome browse. This is just an easy way to get at DNA sequence analysis tools. In this case, it's for worms. You could go to flybase.org if you want and do this for fruit flies. So we're going to use a gbrowse tool, the genome browser. And the easiest way to find a gene is to use the genome browser. Here we're looking at chromosome 3, its entirety from left to right. You don't see DNA sequence yet because this is millions of base pairs on this scale. In this case, enter in some random numbers here in this landmark or region search field. It says Roman numeral 3, colon. And what you're seeing here, and this is where you find the name of a gene to bring to class next time. Down here are a bunch of individual gene names. UNC45, PAR2, DPY1 or Dumpy1, mutations that cause worms to be really fat and squishy and cute looking. The Dumpy genes. Anything else? Oh, we've got lawn one here that makes worm mutations in which make worms long. The very sad unc genes like unc32, unc stands for uncoordinated, so it makes them kind of spastic and paralyzed if you have a mutation in this gene and you're a worm. So to find a random gene, look at a random chromosome, enter in some region coordinates in terms of base pairs. So this is looking at base pair 9,060,076 to base pair 9,071,660. That's where these genes are located. So you can enter in some random number range there. If all else fails, click on the, names of one, the name of one of these genes or enter it up here in the search field. That's what the next screenshot shows. So I'm picking one of these genes to work with, 9,060,000. something, something. You can enter random numbers in there to look at a part of the genome. I've chosen a gene called NUO-1. So I put that gene name. That's all the point of everything we've talked about the last three minutes or so. Find a gene name. Three letters and one or two numbers. Enter that into the search field. So I'm searching for the gene NUO-1. When I search, it brings up the record of that gene. This is where the sequence is located. So find a random gene name, enter it into the search field. This is record. You scroll down, you'll find a part of this web page that says sequences, which is where the sequence is located. We're interested in the coding sequence, which is abbreviated CDS, coding sequence. So there's a link there, which means absolutely nothing, CO9H10.3. That is the coding sequence for the gene NUO1. 
So on your own, you'll click on that. And that brings up probably a list of several different CDS options that you can choose. You want one that says spliced plus UTR. That means fully processed, no introns left, and it's got its untranslated regions. That is, this is the full messenger RNA sequence. It's been processed, and it's got its UTRs. And in between the UTRs will be everything that gets translated. So you click on that, spliced plus UTR. And then it shows you the actual sequence. This is what I'd like you to bring with you next time. Not for this gene. Pick your own gene if you can. You can bring this gene if, if all else fails. That's fine. So here the color coding shows you exons. So if this is fully spliced, each of these different colors, so here yellow, that's one exon. Then the next color, whatever color this is, you tell me, would be exon two. The next color, yellow again, is exon three. So all the introns have been removed. The colors are just showing you which are the different exons. And then the UTRs are the lowercase. So in this case, it's poor, tiny little five prime UTR is only four nucleotides long. But it's got a huge three prime UTR there. And oh, look what's right there. They're not showing the poly A tail, but there's that poly A signal sequence, A, A, T, A, A, A. So the goal is please bring what's highlighted in color there. Copy and paste it onto email to yourself. This is a summary of what I do. we just went over if you want a single page summary to look at while you're doing this process. Email that CDS, just the exon sequences. You don't need the, intron, the, the uh, UTRs. Email it, stick it in a Google Doc that you save to your tablet, something like that, so that you can bring the sequence with you to the start of next class. So you want all the uppercase letters bring the sequence with you. Any questions about that? So a lot of investment in showing you how to do stuff online. I apologize. Next class, there will be basically practically talking of me and almost entirely talking by you to your group mates as you work through some translation exercise. So if you would, please, now that we've done that, take one more Socrative quiz today, and then we'll get together next class and actually look at translating your messenger RNA sequences. So just a second. Okay. Go ahead. And I've got office hours for the next 45 minutes or so. So if anybody wants to come as soon as you're done with the quiz, that's quite all right.